Hello, my name's Andy, and this is a talk about Matrix, which is a distributed real-time database, uh, most commonly known as a chat system, but I want to talk about uh, how to use it, what it's like, um, and how it's more than that, or rather, in order to make a chat system, you have to make a distributed real-time database, which means that there's all kinds of um, amazing stuff you can do with Matrix. We're going to get really deep into technical stuff. We're going to look at like the curl commands, the, the, the exact HTTP JSON that you send back and forth to send a message, um, we're also going to talk about like wider considerations, like some thoughts about how to write a server, stuff like that. Um, so like, um, if you, if you're wondering what Matrix is, or you just heard about it, you want to get into the details of it, uh, to talk for you, but we start off with just a kind of general, um, like what is Matrix anyway? Why is it interesting? Uh, so the first bit of the video might be interesting to you, even if you don't want to get into the technical details. But we'll start off by saying thank you, uh, to two people who've, um, contributed to me on Patreon, and uh, what and the benefit you get for contributing on Patreon is you get thanked on a video. So here's some thank yous. Um, thank you to Enrico Schwass, uh, and thank you to Eugene Yano. Uh, if you want to uh, donate on Patreon, go uh, check me out on patreon.com, uh, or potentially more interesting to me recently, um, check out um, Small Pixel, S-M-O-L-P-X-L, search for that. Uh, it's a game site, and you can see how to support that. This is my game site. Uh, little fun games for uh, kids or anyone who likes a little in-browser game without adverts and any of that stuff. Uh, and also potentially a way to learn about how to write games yourself. Anyway, back to this video. Um, thank you to those contributors. Matrix is a real-time, uh, distributed real-time database. Uh, what do I mean by that? What am I going to cover? Well, first of all, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what Matrix is. Um, and why it's interesting potentially to you. Um, it's for sending messages and so much more. Um, then we're gonna look at the real um, details of what happens when you send a message, what, what uh, JSON gets sent, um, what, gets, what JSON gets returned and stuff like that. What it's like to kind of implement a client, I guess, um, for Matrix, a, a messaging app that talks Matrix. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit more about uh, what, that, what's that, what that JSON structure that we're sending back and forth really is. Uh, by talking about events. Um, and then we'll talk about other types of events other than messages that, that are involved in the matrix protocol. Then we'll talk a bit about what it's like to implement a server, which we'll go into only quite shallowly and talk about what state resolution is. Um, then we'll talk about what I've called the distributed real-time database, but essentially um, uh, like what other stuff you can do with matrix because it has all this cool stuff. And then a bit of more info. So let's get on with what is Matrix. So first of all, first and foremost, what Matrix is, is a network um, or a protocol for um, chatting with people. So um, uh, anyone can write a chat client and some of them look like this. You can see they look like some of the other popular uh, chat clients that are available. Um, but one of the key cool things about Matrix is anyone can write one of these clients, one of these chat programs, and you can talk to anyone else on Matrix. Uh, using them. So you can have things that look like, like personal messages like this, uh, but you can also have um, clients that look more like uh, like work or group messaging. And those um, th that type of client, you can see a few examples on the screen, uh, would be like more like something you'd use at work or something like IRC, and you could join public rooms and things like that. So there are clients that, that support both ways of working, um, and there are, there are clients that are kind of biased in one way or another, but the point is they all speak the same protocol. So you can speak to people using one of these different style clients uh, through the same network. Um, yeah, so like work work chat is a, a key thing that you can do on Matrix. But what else is Matrix? Well, it's more than just chat. It's also, uh, it's more than just say one company, uh, like Element, the company that I work for. Um, it's a whole load of people who are uh, adopting this protocol, this standard way of um, communicating with each other um, at, so to develop it for different uses. So for example, the German healthcare system is adopting Matrix for how people, uh, doctors and people can speak to each other, but also speak to patients and things like that. Um, and and this, the, it's been recently very fashionable to talk about um, interoperability of um, some of these very powerful media companies, the, the software produced by them. Um, so Matrix fits right in there with, um, it is a, a protocol, a way of having lots of different um, systems able to speak to each other. Um, and the way that you can do that at the moment, now maybe this will get better with the European legislation that's coming through, but right now 
you can uh, talk to different systems from within Matrix or have, in fact, have different systems speak to each other through Matrix by using bridges. And here are the, here's a random collection of logos um, of some of the chat systems that at, at one time or another had bridges that could talk to each other through Matrix. And the most popular ones definitely have active working, really nice bridges. Um, I'm spotting some that might have dropped off now because no one's interested in those communication systems anymore. Anyway, uh, there are bridges for between um, lots of different systems and Matrix, which means that you could, for example, be on Slack and be talking to someone on WhatsApp as long as you're talking through uh, a Matrix room. So, um, yeah, um, Matrix is a lot more than just a chat system. It's a way of bringing together all the chat systems. And it's even more than that. Um, uh, and the other cool thing about Matrix uh, that maybe we don't talk about enough is that there are bots. So bots are just um, computer programs that also speak chat. Um, and Matrix is a very open system. So it's very easy to integrate bots with it that can do useful things like um, tell you that there's a new pull request in your GitLab instance or um, display a comic when you ask when it comes out or when you ask for it uh, you know calculate stuff track uh, track how you're feeling about uh, how you know your colleagues are feeling about a particular person or thing uh, send SMS messages uh, like there's a thing that renders latex into um, or like math stuff and also latex into uh, so, so like preview so basically you type a command the bot does something you can imagine could be anything you can think of um, some bots will just type something based on something they've noticed somewhere else and some of them will do it when you send them commands and so on. So what is Matrix really? Well, for, according to the matrix.org website, it's an open network for secure decentralized communication. Uh, and if we unpack that, it's quite a good description. So first of all, and possibly most importantly, it's open. It's open uh, in the sense that it's an open standard. Uh, it's being uh, developed in, in the open or the all the software is completely free software, um, but there's a spec and there's a spec change process, uh, which is open for participation from anyone. It's also open in the sense that the messages that you're sending, the information that you're sending, uh, uses very kind of clear and open protocols. Essentially, you're sending JSON messages over HTTP. Um, even when they're encrypted, there's still JSON that contains the encrypted code. Um, so what else? It's also secure. So um, messages can be end-to-end -end encrypted using a, um, the double ratchet mechanism, which is, has been extended for Matrix to support group communication. That extension is called MegOlm. Um, the uh, encryption has been publicly audited. It's based on the same underlying um, ideas as the Signal protocol, which is this double ratchet thing. Um, but the Matrix implementation has been publicly audited, audited uh, and the uh, Matrix uh, people are in the process of defining a kind of central decentralized version of double ratchet double ratchet uh, called decentralized mls so it's um it's secured using open um and well understood and well known secure end-to-end -end encryption systems um, it's also decentralized and this is something that you won't see in other messaging systems often uh, it's the part that makes it difficult, uh, part that makes it interesting, but also the part that makes it really attractive for a lot of different uses. Um, so the, the easiest way to think about the way in which Matrix is decentralized is that it's similar to email. If you use Gmail or you use Hotmail or you use your own email server or your ISP's email server, um, you only have a relationship with that, that provider, but those providers can all speak to each other so that you can send email to anyone, even if they're on Gmail and you're on Hotmail or something like that. So in a similar way, in Matrix, you have a home server, which is like your Matrix provider, if you like, and you can run that yourself, obviously, um, or, but, or you can also connect to a, a public instance. There's a big public instance on matrix.org. Um, but you can speak to anyone else who's in the same federated network. So you can make completely private um, networks that are federated, talk to each other, um, but no one else. So you might do that if you were, um, I don't know, if you were a very secretive company, you wanted to have two different uh, sites that had their own server and talked to each other, but no, it didn't talk to anyone else. But there's also this huge general federation network of people on Matrix who just want to be able to talk to everyone. Um, so there, all those servers are connected. You can run your own home server, you can connect to a public instance, um, but you're able to talk to anyone else within that network. Um, 
So it genuinely works. It's a really hard problem to solve, much harder than email where messages are kind of fired and then forgotten. Um, but it does work. You can. Uh, we have a genuine federated, uh, secure, end-to-end encrypted chat mechanism that, that, and because of this federation, that's why we can have all these bridges because we just, in a way, just treat them like another bit, another uh, section of the graph um, of decentralized stuff. So um, where this really, where things really come together is a uh, way you get really secure is when you also take into account the decentralized thing. So a lot of companies, organizations, governments, whoever, um, are not really going to be happy that something is secure unless they have control of their own infrastructure. So the point of it being decentralized, or the big big win of it being decentralized, is that you can run your own server, so you can be absolutely sure of your own security setup, but you can still connect to other people if you want to. Um, uh, and then obviously some of the security is then their responsibility, but for any of the communications that are just within your own network, you're completely responsible for the security. Okay, so that was like the big sell of um, what Matrix is. So now let's get into the code and talk about how we're going to send messages um, and what the actual JSON HTTP looks like. So we'll get into the code bit. So first of all, we're going to run our own home server. So Synapse is one of the most popular home servers. You can get its code from GitHub, and then you run it with a command like this. You have to put some a little bit of stuff into home server.yaml and then run it. But essentially, it's just a Python program. Run it on your local machine. Um, and you can see that the first thing we want to do is ask uh, the server what version of Matrix it supports. You can see that it's running on uh, localhost, and by default, it came up on port 8008. Um, and yeah, so to ask the server what uh, what versions of Matrix it supports, we put in this URL. So all the URLs that we're using are going to start with underscore matrix slash client because we are being a client talking to the server. And so we're going to just ask what versions you support. It's, and it's going to list a whole load of versions it supports, including uh, what was at the time I uh, made these slides, the most recent version that isn't anymore. Um, and also a list of like other features that the, um, the server supports that are kind of not part of the standard yet. And we'll get onto some of that stuff later. Anyway, point is, uh, it supports a version that we're happy with. So now we're going to ask uh, to register a new user. Um, so again, the URL starts with um, matrix client. Um, and then you've got the version. So I, these slides I created when the latest version was R0, but now it would be like V1 or V2 or something. Um, so you can kind of ignore the R0 part, but then we're saying, I want to register and we pass in just an empty JSON object um, because what we need is for the server to tell us what types of registration it supports. So the server is going to return as a session ID and then a list of all the flows, registration flows that it supports. Um, in this case, this local server that we've run only supports m.login.dummy, which is a kind of very basic um, registration that you wouldn't use on a real server. Um, but that's fine for us. So we're going to register. Um, so this time we say register again, but this time we provide some more JSON. We say um, the we say which flow we're using, which is this section saying we're using the dummy flow. We provide a username and a password we want to register under. And the, the server responds with our user ID, which is just going to be at our username colon, uh, the domain name of this server. So normally a matrix ID wouldn't say localhost. It would say matrix.org or whatever your home server is. Um, uh, but yeah, this is the form of a kind of user ID in Matrix, uh, user colon, at user colon um, server domain name. Um, and it also gives the, the particular device that we're on an ID. Um, so we, we've now registered our user. So it eases that because the dummy registration is pretty straightforward. Other flows, there might be multiple things you have to do. Um, so once we've registered, now we want to log in. So we ask, we say log in. And we just do a GET request to that. And it, again, it returns us a list of all the login flows that it supports. The one we're interested in is uh, this simple m.login.password form. So now that we know it supports m.login.password, we can make another request to log in, this time a POST request with this bit of, with some JSON in it, which says what flow we're using. And then some information about what how we want to be identified, or how we are identifying ourselves. So. In this case, the type of identification we're using is like a username and password one. So uh, we're just going to say user and then provide our ID, um, um, user ID. And then the, just we have to say the type of user, the type of like identifier we're using, which in this case is just a simple username. And then we provide our password. And the server responds with an access token. 
which is what we're going to use to for our in all our later requests and some other stuff okay so now we've logged in we've got an access token so the first thing we're going to do is just quickly register another user because um, we uh, we're going to send one message from one user to another. So let's register another user, same as the other one, but no, so username ends with two. And now we're going to, back as user one, we're going to um, create a room. So the access token that we were given ends up in this header, which is which is an authorization header with the word bearer, and then the access token that we were given. So you need to provide that to like prove that you're logged in. Um, so that, then the server knows that it's you. And also, while we're creating a room, we're also going to um, give some extra information about that room, which is that we want to invite another user immediately at the time of creation. You can obviously invite users later, but uh, um, yeah. So we we send this post request to the server saying that we want to create a room and we want to invite the user to. And what the server responds with is a room ID. So rooms are really, really important in Matrix. Everything that happens, that's in, well, most things that happen that are interesting, happens in a room. A room is a place where um, you're essentially subscribed to all the things that happen. Um, and uh, if you, so that's if you're in the room, you're, you're like subscribed to everything that happens in that room, and you get you get back the information about what anyone else is sending there, and you can send stuff there yourself, assuming you have the right permissions. Anyway, we've been given a room ID, and room IDs look like this. So they start with an exclamation mark, and then some stuff, and then there's a colon. Um, uh, server domain name. Rooms can also have aliases, which are more pretty names than that, but all rooms have an ID that looks like this. Okay, so we've created a room. Now, just as user one, we want to just ask the server what's going on. So this will be, if you're writing your own client, you're going to be doing this sync thing all the time. So anytime you're in a room and you want to know what's going on in that room, you're going to open up a GET request to this sync URL. Again, you're going to provide your uh, access token that you were given. Um, and what that what the sync request does, it gives you a load of information about the rooms that you're in. For example, this room um, uh, exists and it, it the, the room section is split up into rooms with different statuses. So this is a room that you've joined. So it, the section is called join. And then inside the join section, you get the room ID is the key, and then a timeline, which is essentially everything that's happened in this room. So all the events, um, which are basically messages and things like that, uh, that have happened. And the particular event that we're interested in at the moment is that this room, the first event in the timeline is that this room got created. Uh, and further down in this timeline, there'll also be that invite um, event that we created that invites, where we invited user two. Um, notice also, we have a batch number. This is essentially a number that we can give to the server next time we call sync to say, I've already got all the events up to this this point. Now please just send me the new ones after that. Um, yep, so this is user one just saying, uh, what's, what's going on for me? And, and the answer from the server is, you're in this room and these events have happened in this room. Okay, so next time we sync, we're going to provide, like I was saying, we, we, we've already got the events up to a certain point, so we can provide this since query parameter, and we pass in the thing we were given back on the previous page, and then the server will answer us with whatever's happened since then, uh, and it, the server will give us a new batch number so that next time we ask, um, we don't get the same ones again. And notice it's, this one is pretty much the same as the last one we had, but just one number different. Um, okay, so that was user one just asking what's going on in this room. Uh, so now let's switch to being user two. So you can tell that I'm user two because the access token that I'm using starts with the ABC instead of whatever it was before. So as user two, we're going to ask what's going on. Um, and in this, uh, yeah, and then we get back a batch number like before. But what's interesting about this is that um, in our room section of our sync response, we haven't got a room that says join, as in you've joined a room. We only have a section which says invite, which means these are the this is the list of rooms you've been invited to. So this is the same room ID that we had before, but now we use a two, so we're, we've only been invited to it. And here's the state of the invite, uh, which is basically an event with events about the room, I guess, inside there. So think, so user two now is able to see, I have been invited to a room. And presumably if you're writing a client, you present that to the user to say, you've been invited to this room, do you want to join it? Um, and yeah, so just a little bit more of that event. So 
just continuing off from here inside this events section of this room, um, here is some information about the room. So the room has a member, which is user one. Um, and yeah, and the, the person who sent that event is user one. Um, so yeah, just a bit more information about the room. And then uh, the next thing is that there is a, yeah, sorry. And then the next thing is that there is an invite. So, so going back to the first thing we looked at, this is a membership event uh, where a member has joined the room. If we step forward, this is a membership event where user two has been invited to the room and the sender of that was user one. So that's probably enough information to know, you know, you were invited by this user to join this room. Um, so we've been invited. So well, we can just double check what rooms we're actually in by going to a different endpoint, which is the joined rooms endpoint. And the answer to that for user two, notice we're still user two because we've got this ABC at the beginning of our access token. And the joined rooms list is an empty list. So we haven't actually joined the room yet, we've just been invited. So let's accept the invites. The way we do that is we go to rooms and then the room ID and then join. Um, and uh, it looks like I've got the wrong access token here. That should be ABC because we're, we're currently user two. Um, so we, we just send um, yeah, so it, interestingly, your URL needs to have the room ID in it, but also I'm fairly certain um, this is a post request and you need to have the JSON with the room ID um, in the body of the request as well. So you say, please join this room. And the response is basically, uh, if everything's fine, is, yep, here's the room ID of that room, which you already knew. So that's how you join the room. So now we're going to check what rooms we've joined again by using calling the join rooms. API and we get back a list and the list now is not empty it contains that room ID so now we're going to do a sync and see what happened and uh, when we sync instead of the room being in the invite section we now have a join section and this um, this room ID is inside there and all the events that have happened in that room are now there so basically you're, you can now see what's happening in that room uh, so now if we go back to being user one and we sync um, and we look at all the events that come back for the same room. We can now see there's a new event, which is a room.member, m.room.member event, saying that user2 is now a member, not just invited, but a member um, of this room. So that's how you join a room. Okay, so we've nearly got there. We're going to say something. So here's the way we say things. Um, so again, we go to the rooms um, yeah, section in the URL, the room ID. And then we say send, and then the type of message we're sending, which is an m.room.message. And then we make up a transaction ID. So every time we send a message, um, we do a put request, uh, and uh, uh, not a post request. So the reason for this is that the reason for this transaction ID and the fact that it's a put request is um, if something goes wrong, we want to be able to repeat this um, without the server thinking we've sent another message. Um, so if we just, if this request fails or something like that, we're going to repeat this thing, but maybe the server actually did receive it. You know, you can never quite tell. So the way to do it is to use an idempotent uh, request, to use the lingo, which is a put request with a known transaction ID. Now this transaction ID is made up by the client, so made up by you when you're sending, um, and it only has to be unique within this room for you, right? So you don't have to be clever and make up a transaction ID that's universally, uh, like globally unique or something like that. Um, but it needs to be unique. So like if you send a different message, it needs to have a different transaction ID, basically. Um, and then the body of the message is going to be um, essentially what your message is and the fact that your message is a text message. There are other types that we can, we'll look at later. Obviously, you still need um, a header saying who you are, which is user one. And the response, it gives you back um, basically the event ID that the server has assigned to this new event that you've created. Um, yeah, and you can repeat this as many times as you like, and you won't end up with multiple new messages. If you want a new message that looks the same, use a different transaction ID. So that's how you say something with that put request. You can see it's just really simple JSON over HTTP, right? So maybe I've made this look complicated with all the joining and registering and stuff, but actually sending a message, you just need an access token, a room ID, um, and then you make a put request with some very simple JSON inside it. We've sent a message, so now we need to receives that message. So let's be user two again. Um, we go to sync again. 
And in our, inside our rooms, in the join section, the room ID, we've got a timeline, and the timeline has events in it. And here's an event which has some content in it. The body of that is exactly what we what we sent as user one. So we can see uh, what got sent, and we can see who sent it. User one sent it. And it's the event ID that we saw before is still there too. So that's how you refer back to events later. Um, yeah, so that and so basically that's how you send a message and receive a message. So let's talk a little bit more about what sync is really like. So sync is a long pole HTTP request. So it's a get request to the sync uh, URL um, with the uh, since thing that we talked about before. And you can provide a timeout. Otherwise, the server will kind of default to timeout. So essentially, you, you make that get request. And if nothing happens, that's interesting to you, um, that will just stay open. The server will just hold it open until something interesting happens, like an event in one of the rooms you're in happens or something else like that. And um, you can provide a timeout to say, stop listening after a certain amount of time. Uh, it's a good idea to do that because if you hold a request open for too long, something might go wrong and you might you know, never receive things or something like that. Um, but yeah, so then, uh, yeah, if you sit waiting, then something happens. Like for example, user one sent another message saying it works. Um, and your your sync response comes in. So um, it's kind of a, um, before there were web sockets and stuff like that. This is the way to implement that same kind of technology. There are people working on looking at whether web sockets could be a, a good way to do this. But actually, this works really well. It's really simple, really easy to debug in your browser, really easy to use on the command line using curl. Um, it's good, simple to reason about. So maybe there's nothing wrong with long polling. Okay, so that was how to send messages. Um, on the command line and, and what those messages look like. So let's get a little bit deeper into this JSON that we're passing back and forth. So um, we've been talking about messages and events interchangeably, but yeah, messages are one type of event. An event is essentially a piece of JSON uh, quite often has been put into that timeline, that list of events. There are some types of event that, that don't live in the timeline. Um, and when you send an event, when you create a new event as a client, um, you send a bit of JSON which which we, we just saw as a like JSON that was in the body of the uh, put request. But actually, that that's what it's referred to as the content of the event. So when the events come back from the server, they've got a whole load of properties like an, an ID, uh, sender, what type of message it is. And they also have the content, which is the bit you provided. Uh, yeah, the ID and a sender. And the type is also part of the URL in our put request, right? So. The way the server knows what type of message you're talking about is this chunk of the URL here. And uh, like, so a well-known uh, message type is m.room.message. All the kind of well-known stuff in matrix that's standardized starts with m. Okay, but you can put different content in there. So we've previously we've seen body and message type, but you can also have formatted body, um, which could be some uh, HTML. And the for you say, have to say what the format is. In this case, we're saying HTML. Notice that this is not fully standardized, um, or, or maybe it is, but it, anyway, normally non-fully standardized stuff doesn't start with M dot. So in this case, uh, it starts with just something else. Um, I'm not 100% sure that actually maybe this was standardized, but we're still using an old um, ID. I don't know. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that's, so this is the old way of writing messages. The way that we're kind of working on now or trying to standardize is a new way of uh, creating messages which is a bit more flexible um, for stuff. And one of the consequences of that flexibility is that we can kind of tidy up uh, message types so that we don't have this weird thing where you can have either text or something else. You can have multiple different ways of representing a message and be really clear about what type they have. So for example, um, a plain text message has a MIME type of text plain. Um, looks like this, or you could have an HTML message with something else. You could also have different formats and provide a MIME type uh, in there. This is something that's it's not here yet, and you can read my blog post um, and that will link to the actual formal specification proposal um, in there uh, to learn a bit more about extensible events. They're not they're not in yet, um, so maybe you don't have to worry about it yet. Or maybe if you're watching this in a couple of years, maybe this is the only way you can write messages now. But um, one other thing about extensible events is that there is an abbreviated form because this looks a bit long, so there is a shorter form, and you can read that blog post to find out. Okay, so that was message events. Um, there are there are other types. So the main types that I know about are message events, which are things that sit in the timeline and just are kind of relevant for a particular point in history. State events, which are about the whole um, 
Because things that are kind of true long term that you need to know about when you join a room. So that kind of state of the room and ephemeral events, ephemeral events, which are just events that happened at a moment, but you don't care. If you weren't there, you weren't listening at that moment, you probably don't care. There may be other events types as well, I'm not sure. Um, so here are some examples of message events. So we've already seen normal messages where you just send some text or some HTML to say something. There are also redactions, which are uh, ways of um, del some kind of deleting events, although in a distributed system it's quite hard to talk about really but deleting things uh, and we're going to look at another example uh, of an uh, event which has a specific purpose which is polls uh, there are lots of lots of others um, so normal messages we've already seen as I said it's got a, a body and potentially a formatted body uh, and then a redaction uh, is like I said a way of deleting events so basically you the event content has a reason why you're redacting for example the person was spamming and then the, we just say, which event do we want to delete the content of, essentially? And that's what this redacts is for. So a well-behaved server, when it receives one of these redactions, it will delete the content of the message, um, but it, will, uh, it won't delete uh, some of the surrounding data around it. So basically the way the, way the kind of distributed um, nature of matrix works is that there's this um, data structure of a, a, like a graph inside the server where you you track which event happened after which event and stuff like that. So if you if you just delete something from the middle of that graph, the whole thing collapses. You, there's nothing for the other, the next bits of the graph to lean on. So you have to keep the 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 date enough data that that graph still makes sense, but you delete the contents of the message. Um, and but I don't think I don't think you, we delete the sender information. But I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, so if you yeah read more in the spec if you want to find out the details of how reductions work, um, but yeah as I said a well-behaved server will delete the contents of the message so that when clients then ask what happened in this room they will to see an event happened but it's been deleted. Um, uh, but you can't make any guarantees if you're participating with uh, like a badly behaved server because one of your users uh, is on that server. Maybe that server keeps deleted, uh, redacted messages forever. So you can never be 100% sure, unless you control the entire infrastructure, that deleted messages are really gone. I mean, and that's not that different from other um, systems where you can never be absolutely sure that someone didn't uh, take a photo of their phone with the message on it or you know, something like that. Once a message has gone out there, it's hard to guarantee that it's really gone again if you try and delete it. But anyway, redactions are uh, a way of signaling your intention to delete them. And in the normal federated network, um, it will actually get deleted from all the, all the servers participating. Um, another type of event that is just a good example of the fact that these events can do all kinds of different things. So and this is something that I was involved in implementing not too long ago. Um, poll events. So a poll is like asking a question, just like on uh, Twitter or, or some other chat systems. You want to ask a question and say, uh, which, which of these options do you prefer? Um, you can send an event and you give it a type of um, poll.start and if and when this gets standardized that would be like m.poll.start because it's not standardized we use this pref this kind of non-standard prefix and we use the MSC number so an MSC is a spec change proposal matrix spec change um, and so the the polls um, feature has this spec this proposed spec change to say that this is how we do polls so basically that if you read in in this MSC um, which you can find on the on the GitHub on uh, Matrix Matrix's GitHub. Um, it specifies all the information about what lives inside a poll, like quite, you know, this question, this answers, and exactly what how this JSON is structured is essentially what this MSC is saying. Um, so if we want to start a poll, we send a message with with that type, and then we send a question um, with some text in it and some answers with some text in it, um, and then people can. Um, uh, reply by sending a different type of message yeah so a poll dot start is like create a poll there's also like a, a way of responding with a different event type which i don't remember the type of um so people can vote in the poll and then once people have voted then all those that information about a poll got started and then this person voted then this person voted all gets collected together and in your in your chat program if it supports this feature um it'll show you how many votes were were made for each uh, option uh, you can also close polls and things like that. Anyway, point is, this is a different type of event that has different JSON structure, um, and 
if your client doesn't support this type of thing, it'll essentially just kind of ignore those events. Um, so the point to make about this is that polls at the moment, at the time of um, speaking, uh, is an unstable feature. I'm kind of hoping eventually it will get standardized and, and included in the metric spec. Uh, I'm kind of working on pushing that through. Uh, you can read more about this proposal at the link here. Um, but yeah, it, but it, this, this feature is available in some of the clients, especially in um, the element clients. Um, it, and it is allowed and encouraged to implement things that are not currently in the spec. Um, it's kind of good citizenship to try and get them into the spec if they're generally useful. You could imagine some clients doing some specialized things would use stuff that's kind of, they try and standardize for themselves, but not that not expect normal clients to use. But for stuff like polls, that's like a normal thing for a chat client to want to do. Um, it's good citizenship to make an MSC and um, try and get it uh, merged into the standard, but it's totally fine for you to implement the feature uh, based on that proposed standard, um, even if it hasn't been standardized yet. It's, that's the way the matrix spec kind of progresses. Um, and it's a rule that we don't like to standardize things unless there is an implementation that kind of shows that the ideas work. Okay, so there are other types of events. Um, so as I said, message events represent um, a thing that happened at a particular time. There are also these things called state events. So state events are things that um, give you information about a room in more general terms. Um, not just this happened at this time, but um, something that is true of a room. For example, it got created. In, that's like the first event in any room. Um, but also the name of the room is this, which is something you need to know if you join the room much, much later, right? So it's the state, not just the thing that happened at a time. And also which people are members of a room are state events. There's lots of other types of state events. Um, so for example, to create a room, you send an event with type uh, m.room.create and it has a state key. In this case, the state key is empty when you're creating a room. Um, when you're naming a room, um, the content is the, the name of the room. And the type is m.room.name and again, the state key is empty. And when uh, someone's becoming a member of a room, the content is information about them. Uh, the type is m.room.member and the state key is their matrix user ID. Um, so yeah, notice all of these events have a state key. Uh, and these events are things for uh, information that is kind of always relevant, not just relevant at a particular time. So to be a state event, all you need to do is have a state key. That's the, that's the rule. Okay, uh, one other type of events I want to talk about is ephemeral events. So here's an example of an ephemeral event. Ephemeral event is basically something that happens at a particular time, but if you come, come in later, you don't even care about the fact that it happened, let alone uh, like finding out about it immediately, like a state event. But even if you go back through history, you won't be able to find it. So an example is uh, someone is typing. If you want to see, uh, if you're in a, uh, uh, a me uh, you're messaging with someone, you want to see whether they're typing, they send an m.typing event. Uh, and in fact, the content is like a list of all the people who are typing. Um, but if you come along later, you really don't want to see um, uh, who was typing at a particular time. So ephemeral events just disappear. And the way you can kind of tell that they're going to disappear is they don't have an event ID. Um, so there's kind of no way of referring back to them later. They don't end up in the timeline. They just get sent to you um, at the time if you're interested. Okay, so that was uh, some types of events. So let's talk about what it's like to write a server. So, we, so we've seen it's really quite simple to write a client, right? You just send events using uh, some JSON and you, you you call sync and you get, you get to find out what happened. So it's essentially like a publish subscription model. By joining a room, you're essentially saying I'm subscribed to the events that happened in that room. And then you can uh, send HTTP, send JSON over HTTP to say, uh, make a new event that everyone in the room finds out about. But to make a server with all the um, federation and uh, like syncing up with servers all around the internet, some of which may have been offline for months or whatever, um, we need to be quite clever. We've essentially biased the um, design so it's really easy to make a client, but that means it's, it's quite difficult to make a server. Um, uh, so, so, like I said, servers can get out of sync. Some, some bit of the internet could go down, your server could be turned off or something like that. Um, you could even just be chatting to your friend and your two servers can talk to each other or you're on one server, um, but then there's other people chatting somewhere else on the internet and you, your internet is down. So you end up out of sync with other people. And a key part of um, 
the matrix protocol is that we need to agree on what really happened. Uh, and in particular, we need to figure out which event came first. Uh, for example, to find out whether someone was banned before they sent this message, um, or whether they sent the message and then they got banned later. So, you know, something like that. Um, so we need a way of agreeing what happened before what, even though in principle there's kind of no, um, you know, there's no ordering between things that happened when the two servers were out of sync. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the event graph. So I referred to this a little bit earlier when I was talking about redactions and saying we can't just remove things from this graph. So by graph here, I don't mean like a, a chart with um, like quarterly sales. By graph, I mean um, dots with lines in between them. Um, so here we've got events like things that happened. So these could be messages or in fact, they're probably more interesting events like someone got got made into a member of this room or someone got banned from this room, stuff like that. And a newer event always refers back to at least one previous event that happened before it. Um, so this is what a kind of normal event graph looks like. But then if there's some breakdown in communication, we could end up with two servers that have different event graphs. You can see they both have this uh, event called oldest, but then one server has a load of events we're calling A1, A2, and A3. And the other server has only B1 and B2, and they don't have they don't have each other's events. So there's been a, a like a fork. There's been a situation where um, two servers disagree about what happened. So what do we do? Well, when so at some point this the internet is going to come back on again, um, and these two servers are going to join up, and they're going to send all the events that they've got to each other. So now in both of those servers, we've got a situation where they have um, all the events. But the graph isn't a nice straight line anymore. It's it's shaped more like this. So they both got the oldest event, but then these other events happened. So that's fine. Like just having that graph uh, shape is absolutely fine. The, the server can continue to work perfectly. Where we need to do so-called state resolution is when two of the events in that graph conflict with each other. So they both try and change some important piece of information or state in this case, uh, and what the changes they're making conflict. So for example, one person. Uh, on one side of the graph, someone is getting promoted to be an admin of the room, and on the other side of the graph, that person is getting banned, right? So in that case, we've got to figure out um, which came first, and and therefore, like, which one wins in the in the battle. So imagine that we have a conflict, not just a, a, like a branch graph, but a conflict like this. How do we figure out what happened? Well, the key question is, in what order did things happen? Um, once you know the order, as if as if you had just a straightforward uh, graph where it just goes downwards, then we can always figure out exactly what happens. And a key thing is not just we need to figure out an order, but all the servers involved in this process need to figure out the same order as each other, even though they started off in different states like this. Okay, so what we do is we use Khan's algorithm, which sounds um, clever, but really is quite straightforward when you think about it. We um, we look at the graph shape. So this is just to how to make an ordering that, um, of these events. Uh, we look at the graph shape. By the way, I haven't been very um, formal about exactly which events I'm talking about here. These, in some of the the stuff I'm saying here, these are just state events. In some of the the, the situations I'm talking about here, these are so-called auth events, which are kind of the state events that are important for um, authorization of like who's in the room, who's who's banned, and, and who has this power level. Um, so I haven't been very formal about that. So do read the um, follow the link and read the, the real information about state resolution. Anyway, um, to to make an ordering, we use Khan's algorithm, which is essentially um, anything with no arrows in the pointing into it is like the newest. So A3 and B2 are kind of equal newest, but they are the newest. So we take A3 and B2 out and put them at the bottom, say so they're newest. Um, and then we can, if we remove them from the graph, we've now got a new lo load of nodes which have no arrows going into them. So those are the kind of next newest. And then uh, there's only, this time there's only one that's the newest, so we move that. Uh, and now we've got an, an order, but um, we haven't managed, we haven't actually um, be broken any ties yet. So that's Khan's algorithm just gives us the ability to put them into kind of a list like this of, of layers. And then we need to make some kind of decision about which one out of those two, or it could be more than two in each layer. And uh, for that, we use like matrix specific stuff. So um, for example, like things like the timestamps, which we, normally we don't really listen to timestamps because they could be, someone could be lying about them. But for this resolution, we use things like timestamps, even the event ID, just some way to um, arbitrarily, but very consistently between all the servers, 
uh, order those things. Now we have an ordering. Once we have an ordering, we can figure out um, uh, like which came first and therefore what, what happened. Um, and yeah, the important outcome of this state resolution process is that if a server has the same events, uh, you get the same result, uh, even if those events came to you in different orders. And it's worth probably pointing out a slight contrast with something like blockchain. Um, in the blockchain, if you have a disagreement between do two different branches of the, the tree, uh, it's it's really important to decide which one was right and then throw away the other one. Uh, and that, there's a contrast here in Matrix. Uh, we're quite happy for both both sides to be right. We just need to find a way of kind of merging them together um, so that everyone agrees what really happened. Um, so we have the state resolution algorithm, um, which lets us take all of these events that potentially disagree and figure out uh, what the truth is. And importantly, different servers, if they have the same events, will get the same answer. Okay, so that was state resolution. That's kind of some of the pain that will uh, will come to you if you try and implement a server. Uh, now on to uh, like the exciting stuff about um, how Matrix turns out to be a lot more than just chat. So in order to write a, a chat system, you need to essentially implement what I'm calling a distributed real-time database. So, so what I mean by that is not just that events pass from one person to another, but they're, they're stored somewhere um, and can be recalled quickly, but also they pass rapidly from one person to another. So you've got the real-time part, um, which is like if I send a message, someone receives it quickly. Uh, you've got the distributed bit, which is a whole federation uh, network, uh, like lots of people all kind of working together to build this this, data, this structure of data. And we've got database because this doesn't this isn't just messages passing around like a system like XMPP is. This is data that is stored and can be recorded later. So the reason why we need a database is so that we can receive messages uh, that arrived when we were offline or so that we can support m multiple devices. If we add another device, we want to be able to see the messages that were received by different devices. Um, also, we just want to be able to scroll backwards through chat history. Um, and it, uh, like we need to be able to deal with the fact that some servers are going to just disappear and then reappear later. Uh, we need to give them the events that they missed. So um, yeah, we need to store it. And uh, like I was describing in the previous section, um, if we want to have this kind of state resolution mechanism, we've got to be able to store the events and give them to other servers when they ask for them. So it's not good enough to just pass messages. We need to be a database in the sense that you can find stuff later. And and by the nature of it, Matrix is distributed in real time. So we've ended up, in order to have a chat working in a nice way, that you can have these features, we've ended up implementing a distributed real time database. Um, uh, but a distributed real-time database is exactly what you need to do loads of other cool things. For example, um, negotiating video conferences, like who's talking to whom and stuff like that. Or um, working together on a document like in um, like collaborative document creation, like you know, both editing a, a rich text document at the same time or a spreadsheet. Um, also immersive environments, you know, like 3D worlds um, or virtual reality or something where you're uh, communicating with other people. Uh, but also peer-to-peer um, -peer messaging where you... Um, uh, you don't have a server, or that uh, really the server's on your phone or something like that. You don't have the internet, but you can still talk to each other, um, uh, and then later maybe sync up with the rest of the internet. So it actually, I've been saying like Matrix is chat, and then, um, but it turns out you can do this other sort of stuff. But actually, uh, the original designers of Matrix always had in mind that this was going to be a lot more than just um, a chat system, where it they actually. Um, to, uh, like expressed it as there's a missing real time layer uh, on the internet. The, the internet is good at um, like providing uh, kind of static information like the World Wide Web, um, but what's missing is a way of kind of creating a kind of collaborative real time uh, interaction mechanism. And Matrix is um, is that thing, or it's attempting to be that thing, and that's why it, that's why it's so important. It's an open standard, by the way. So, for example, video conferencing, voice rooms. Um, so, WebRTC is a really great standard for sending video streams and voice streams and stuff like that to each other, but it doesn't provide you with the negotiation of like who's calling whom, um, uh, who's who's put down the phone, so on and so on. So, um, that 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 that's generally called a signaling layer, and we can do the signaling over Matrix. There's this incredible MSC 3401. 
um, which defines how we can do the signaling. Um, and what's amazing about it is it allows for a federated video conferencing or voice conferencing system. So it's not just one server that everyone connects to and then it negotiates who's talking to whom and then the video streams get sent around. The the actual um, the video conferencing servers, like someone like, say, the Zoom server or the Jitsi server or someone like that, um, they can actually be federated with each other. So they can use MSC 3401 to talk to each other. You can have multiple of those servers which take which the uh, normal video streams connect to, and then they can send the video streams to each other. So, for example, you could be in in one company talking to people from another company, and you both have your own video server, which, by the way, you, you trust the security and blah, blah, blah. And then those two video servers can talk to each other using this signaling layer, using this MSC, um, and... Um, uh, and then you could all be talking to people from that other company, but you're all using your own video server to do it. So this is all almost completely theoretical at the time of speaking. Uh, there are some implementations appearing, uh, but what is completely not um, uh, theoretical, but is actually working, is that there's a, a, a program called Element, or a website really, called Element Call, which, which is working right now for video call conferencing, but it's individual peer-to-peer -peer at the moment, so what what we call full mesh. So basically, it uses the same MSC three four zero one uses uses that design um, to do the signalling. Uh, but we don't have the bit I was just saying was really exciting, which is the federated um, SFUs. They're called these central video servers. Um, it, at the moment, it, it just they just communicate directly with each other and they open up peer-to-peer -peer video calls directly with each other. So what's nice about that, and this will continue to be supported in Matrix, is that there's no server at all. You just, if you can talk to someone over Matrix, you can open up WebRTC um, uh, uh, channels to each to everyone who's in this video chat, and they will all talk to each other. Um, so you, you might wonder, well, why do we need the servers at all? Well, the point is, you can't get more than say about seven people or so in a call before all those people sending video calls to each other um, just becomes too much bandwidth and too much to handle. So you can't have big video calls with uh, like a full mesh system. Um, but you can have small video calls with a full mesh system, which are completely end-to-end -end encrypted. No one else is involved. You just talk to each other over a matrix to negotiate who's talking to whom and open up these secure WebRTC streams. So like the security of it is absolutely amazing. Uh, but yeah, later for, vi for, for large video calls, there's a prototype that's being worked on, but at the moment we don't have it. But these so-called SFUs that can federate with each other the answer for like essentially a kind of matrix like federated system but for video calls uh, in incredible bit of innovation happening there uh, what else well uh, all different types of collaborative creativity for example there's this interactive whiteboard called the board um, where you can work together with other people to uh, like whiteboard uh, and all of that's going through matrix uh, there's a, a library called collabs which lets you build a collaborative editor like a text editor where you're, you're all typing at the same time um, there's something called CRDT, um, which is the like the new hotness in like collaborative um, uh, creativity. Um, CRDTs are just a way of um, thinking about or structuring data so that two things could happen at the same time, but you still know what, um, what your document looks like. Um, so you can build um, collaborative editors based on metric CRDT. Um, there's also um, other like amazing stuff that's completely different, like a system for like managing a file storage through Matrix, um, and yeah, the kind of key thing to understand about all these systems is that everything is a room. So if you're working on a whiteboard together, uh, that whiteboard is like in a room or is a room. Uh, just some more examples. These screenshots are way out of date because Third Room now looks way cooler than this. But there's this project called Third Room, which is for uh, virtual reality environments that are all happening through Matrix. Um, there's also other amazing systems like Peer-to-Peer, -peer, um, which essentially you're running a server on your own device. You don't need to trust someone else to run a server for you. Um, but you can still talk to each other. So if your government turns off the internet, but you're at a protest and you need to speak to each other, you can talk to talk. In, like when this is done, and by the way, this is in, in development at the moment, not completely done, but when this is done, you'll be able to talk to each other over Bluetooth, and if someone at some long chain of Bluetooth has connection to the internet, then your messages can eventually get out to the internet. So peer-to-peer -peer is like a heavily work in progress, um, as is third room, the, the virtual reality environment. But they are, they are coming together, and they sit on top of this distributed real-time database that is Matrix, um, but allow us to do incredible stuff. 
Okay, so I've covered loads and loads of stuff. Um, you might want to get more information. You should definitely check out matrix.org and especially check out the epic uh, blog post Mega Matrix Holiday Special 2021. Maybe there's a 2022 one by the time you're watching this. I don't know. Um, you can get all the links that are in the slides by going to artificialworlds.net slash presentations slash matrix is a distributed real-time database. Um, there'll be some links in the um, in the notes of this video. Um, that blog post has loads more detail on all that, especially the stuff I was talking about just at the end there. Um, more information about me, you can find out um, more generally about my projects that I'm working on at artificialworlds.net, read my blog, uh, the small pixel games website that I was talking about earlier. You can play lots of fun um, little uh, retro style games and learn how to write your own. Um, you can follow me on YouTube or Diode Zone or Twitch. Uh, where I live stream every Monday with some Rust coding and on Matrix. Uh, you can follow me on Mastodon. Uh, you can play my Android and desktop game Rabbit Escape. Look at artificialworlds.net for loads more information. Follow me on Mastodon to find out what's going on. Thanks for watching. Uh, do get involved with Matrix. It's a totally cool project. And see you soon.